My name is George Galloway, presenter of Kale Mahorra on Al Maedin Television. My you. I don't mince my words. I speak Kale Mahorra, and my audience does too. Kale Mahorra, free word, free for me, free for you. Catch it. Nice to meet you, brother. Welcome to Kalimahora with me, George Galloway, on Al Maidin Television, coming to you from London, but discussing China, China and the Arab world. That the tectonic plates are shifting is scarcely debatable any longer in the world. With every military setback on the Ukrainian front, with every sign that the sanctions against Russia have miserably failed, in fact, worse than failed, with the ruble as the best performing currency of uh, 2022, it's scarcely debatable that the plates are shifting, and not just on the Russian-Ukraine issue. Few signs were as clear as when the Chinese leader, Xi Jinping, went to Saudi Arabia, and when the leaders of the Gulf states came scurrying to Riyadh or Jeddah to have their picture taken in the company of the new princes and the new rulers of the international scene. Not that any of them would have described it in those terms. But the situation is clear. China is overtaking the American economy fast. The American economy is based increasingly on printing what will one day be worthless paper money. The European countries have gone into a kind of economic eclipse with their population hungry in some cases, cold in most, and fearful of their future. The Eurasian era is clearly emerging in front of our eyes, even if we seek to avert them. The reality is that the United States star in the Arab world has scarcely ever been lower. A survey recently showed that more than 80% of young people in the Arab world regarded the United States as a problem for them, for their lives, and for their country. And Newsweek in January, on its front page, declared that 75% of the world is not with us on these great confrontational issues. As a matter of fact, Newsweek severely underestimated the level of opposition to what they call Western policy. A good point at which to remind you that only 13% of the world's population live in the countries that describe themselves as the West, though they include Australia and Japan, which isn't really, if you know what I mean in the West. So the 13% are no longer able to make their writ run. And that inevitably encourages, with the shifting of those plates, people to make judgments and decisions about who'll be up and who'll be down. Will the biblical prophecy of the last one now one day being first, the first one day being last, be coming to pass in front of our eyes. I'm joined by a panel of distinguished experts. As always, I am the enthusiastic amateur. Let's hear what they think is going on. Keith Bennett is the father of all China experts, co-founder of Friends of Socialist China, and a very considerable authority on all matters Chinese. Keith, is it a geopolitical flip what's going on? Are the Arab countries, irrespective of their previous stances and even current stances on conflicts in the world, are they beginning to move into China's orbit? Well, I think there's 
really a, a sea change in China's relations with, with the Arab world. I think I qualify it in two ways. One, many people present when the, there are dealings between China and the Arab countries or China and Africa, for example, as something that began yesterday. Uh, it didn't begin yesterday. It has a, a long history. I mean, it has a long history in ancient history of the, the Silk Roads and so on, but it has a, a long history in the People's Republic of China's uh, diplomacy. And within that, uh, Saudi Arabia and China established diplomatic relations back in 1990. But that was that's a fair time ago for quite a lot of people. Uh, but it's comparatively recent in that I'm pretty certain that Saudi Arabia was the very last um, Arab country to establish uh, relations with China. So it's interesting to see them uh, you know, taking this, this initiative now. And um, I also think that perhaps if I can put it this way, people like ourselves have a tendency to count the United States out. I mean, the United States, I think, is strategically on the way down, but, but it's resilient. They're not going to give up their place uh, without a fight. And the, the Saudis, I think, still have a lot invested in the, in the US relationship. But nevertheless, it, it's a really uh, significant turn. And as you said, they, they basically all, all came running. There was um, 20, there were two, uh, there was a state visit to Saudi Arabia. There were also two summits, a first summit between China and the Gulf Cooperation Council, and the first summit between China and the League of Arab States. Um, 21 states were, were represented. Uh, besides, and in, including the Saudis, Xi Jinping had one-to-one -one meetings as well as the general um, by summit, meet, uh, summit meetings. He had one-to-one -one meetings with leaders of se a total of 17 Arab countries at that time. And a huge number of agreements were signed on literally everything from um, esports and e-gaming through to, through to nuclear energy. Most importantly, of course, we're seeing the rise of the petro yuan that um, Saudi Arabia, which is um, China is its largest trading partner and, Sa and Saudi Arabia is the main exporter of oil to China. But Saudi Arabia and the other states of the Gulf are going to move towards trading in yuan and, and, uh, rather than the dollar, which goes back to your comment just now about worthless pieces of paper. Yes, uh, of course, the older you get, the, the more different the issue of short and long term uh, becomes. I remember Mr. Tony Benn telling me he once asked Zhou Enlai what the impact of the French Revolution in 1789 had been, and Zhou Enlai answered, it's too early to say. So not new, but comparatively new. Russia has been a player in the Arab world for very much longer and in a much more significant way with uh, very close alliances from time to time with certain Arab countries. And of course, the European colonists ruled it uh, in, uh, in the 20, uh, right up to the 20th century. So uh, it's new-ish, this Chinese emphasis. But there's one issue that dominates Arab politics, whether they talk about it or not, and it's the Palestine issue. What's China's stance on Israel-Palestine? Well, I mean, China has got a long relationship with the Palestinian people. Uh, Yasser Arafat made 14 official visits uh, to China. When the People's uh, Palestine Liberation Organization was formed in 1964, China was the first uh, country to uh, to, to recognise the, the first non-Arab country to recognise the PLO. The first PLO fighters arrived in China for military training in 1965. So the relationship um, go, um, goes back to that, that stage. And, and this was underlined in the meeting that uh, Xi Jinping had in Riyadh with uh, Mahmoud Abbas. And it was reiterated in, in the joint statement uh, between that was issued by the China-Arab League uh, summit. And specifically, Xi Jinping also referred to it in his speech when he said that um, the rights the rights of uh, a nation uh, cannot be traded away, that the historical injustices um, done to the Palestinian people have to be overcome, and that China maintains a consistent support for the founding of uh, an independent Palestinian state. 
Interesting. Uh, Joseph Robertson, you're uh, the strategic director of the Orthodox Conservatives Group in the United Kingdom and always a welcome uh, guest on Kali Mahorra. Uh, from, if you like, your side of the political spectrum, do you see the kind of shift that Keith describes as happening there in the Gulf as something significant, something permanent, something to be worried about? Well, um, I don't know if it's something to be worried about, but it's something that's inevitable. And I think what is to be worried about is how, uh, how we respond to it, certainly in Britain. Um, I think the question's perhaps being looked at from the wrong perspective by a lot of people is the question of, is China trying to push the US out? I think that's the wrong question. I think it's the fact that the nations are trying to pull China in. Um, and as a result of that, uh, US hegemony is going to weaken. Um, I think the reasons why China would want to have uh, you know, consolidation in that area are, are purely economical. Um, I don't think there's uh, any appetite in China to become the world's police, as the US often has been called. Um, I don't think China is looking to take over in any military capacity in the region. I think it's a purely economic shift. And we've been warning about this um, at the think tank that, 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 I, that I run for a long time now. We've said the BRICs are going to be rising um, and we, we've been calling on this for a couple of years. People weren't listening. Now they've seen what's happening with the ruble and now they've seen what's happening with oil. And it's all becoming very apparent that uh, we need to start looking for fresh policy solutions in the West, as, as we like to style it, um, because the idea of the US just being the predominant and preeminent partner is no longer the case. Um, these smaller nations that, you know, have had less of uh, economic impact in the past are beginning to ally in different ways now. Um, and I think the Shanghai Cooperation Organization is, is a massive part of that. Um, these countries like Turkey, for instance, are beginning to see that there are alternatives to the EU. There are alternatives to the Western hegemony. And they're beginning to look at that, not just from the economic perspective, which I think is China's predominant aim, but also from the military and strategic importance of that. Iran being the most uh, sort of prolific partner, I guess, um, that's close to the Middle East, uh, that's actually joined the cooperation. Um, and I think we're going to have to address that from a completely different perspective. So it shouldn't be seen as a zero sum game, uh, is what you're saying, that it's not China or the United States, but the United States has to recognize that China is there and yeah. present. I do see a threat from China, but I don't see a military or geopolitical threat um, to us at home here. I think it's predominantly in terms of technology and predominantly in terms of economic factors. There have been worrying signs where China goes in and often distributes its gifts. There's often a price to pay with that, as we saw in, in Africa a few years ago when it, uh, you know, kindly distributed technology into the African Summit House and then was found to be bugging some areas within the house. Um, so it never happened here. Yeah, well, it could and it probably has. They're bugging, uh, but... they're bugging us, <laughs> talking right now. But I guess beyond that threat, I don't see uh, an imminent, for instance, uh, invasion anywhere, which is some, you know, uh, people would like to scare us with. Yeah. Uh, Shahid Dasgir Khan a student activist in Pakistan, now an eminent lawyer and human rights activist in, in England. Uh, how does it look uh, to you, as it were, with your Asian eyes? Uh, how do you view China now being courted and, and given the red carpet treatment in the Gulf? Yeah, that is uh, not surprising at all. I remember from my early days as a child even even then uh, in uh, Pakistan when I was at school uh, Chinese delegations used to come there were cultural exchanges uh, there, there was talk of economic cooperation uh, of course the uh, military cooperation as well so uh, China's presence uh, within the Commonwealth it's not something uh, which is uh, which which is uh, threatening or new, and I think what needs to be done is to understand how the politics is shifting. Politics, I would emphasize, and and the power politics is shifting. Uh, the Commonwealth countries would like to develop into emerging economic nations. 
and uh, in the recent past, uh, what we have seen in Afghanistan and in Iraq, Syria, uh, the U.S. Uh, power uh, domination uh, and, and um, uh, hundreds of thousands of children and women uh, uh, were killed or maimed, uh, that, has, uh, that does not go down well with, with countries in the Middle East as well as uh, in the East. So, uh, for example, if you uh, look at China's uh, uh, progress in terms of uh, relations, with those with countries in the east, uh, Malaysia, for example, is one of the biggest partners, uh, uh, trading partners uh, uh, with China. Uh, the Malaysian uh, governments have been thinking about uh, staying, one would say, neutral, uh, but they feel a little bit threatened with the U.S. presence uh, and domination. They, they they want to be free. Similarly, countries like uh, for example, Pakistan, and Pakistan has influence over Middle Eastern countries such as uh, Saudi Arabia and the UAE. And even in this, uh, the, the, the meetings that uh, have recently taken place and there has been contact in the past, Pakistan ha uh, has played some part in bringing closer uh, these uh, uh, China and, and, and uh, the Saudis, for example, uh, and the UAE countries. So there has been uh, backdoor diplomacy going on for quite some time. Yes. Let's get a European perspective then. Dr. Alessandro Arduino is from Turin in Italy. He's the principal research fellow at the Middle East Institute at the National University of Singapore and a man uh, well versed on China's development. Uh, Professor, welcome to the show. Thank you for having me today, George. Uh, doctor, when uh, President Biden uh, went to Riyadh, he got a casual fist bump and left empty-handed, despite being there to ask for oil concessions from the Saudi leadership. And yet when the Chinese president went there, he actually reached multiple long-term and very valuable agreements. How do you uh, account for the difference in those two outcomes? But first of all, uh, the, the visit uh, of President Xi Jinping to the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia was much part of the talk. Uh, even when President Xi Jinping uh, was uh, not able to do the first trip, uh, as the first trip outside China after three years of COVID lockdown uh, was uh, to Kazakhstan. But then when he moved to uh, the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia for the official state visit, uh, Again, energy was much part of the discourse uh, as China basically absorbed 20% of the energy from the kingdom and almost 40% from, uh, from the Gulf. And in this respect, uh, presidency was able to ink more than 35 deal, totaling more than 30 billion US dollar in value. Of course, uh, if we just compare the type of reception that uh, Mohammed bin Salman, Crown Prince of Saudi Arabia and de facto ruler of Saudi Arabia offered to, to Biden compared to the one more lavish offered to Xi Jinping, it I think say already all about the relationship that the kingdom is looking to carve with China comparing with the one of the United States. Well, on the visit, President Xi Jinping signed a plethora of agreements uh, with not just Saudi Arabia, but with the Gulf Cooperation Council more generally on everything from, from digital to security matters, commercial, industrial, import, export, and so on. Does this all look to you, therefore, uh, like we're going to see a much more visible presence of China in the region? Uh, China uh, has been uh, a player in, uh, in the Gulf, in the Middle East and the MENA region for a long time. Uh, recently, uh, in the last uh, five years or even the last decade, there has been an increase uh, of uh, trade relationship, uh, not only with the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia, but also with the UAE, 
and we other country in the Gulf. China is increasing trade. We can say that uh, the Middle East uh, is looking more east for trade, is pivoting to the east, uh, but still uh, for security reason is looking west. That means that uh, in this agreement, China has increased not only the energy security deals, uh, trade, uh, but also is expanding its cyber realm and some security cooperation. Is this all a maneuver by China to, as it were, edge the United States out to lessen their influence, to take their place? What do you think? In this respect, uh, yes, it's important for China expanding the relationship. Uh, and we can say that uh, with increased uncertainty, already in uh, 2022, the name of the game uh, was uh, regional balancing, meaning each country was trying to hedge its bet uh, in diversifying international relation. As uh, in the Middle East, uh, there is still a diffuse perception of US security umbrella retiring. That's not the case. US is moving to the former role of regional offshore security balancer. And China, during the visit of President Xi Jinping in the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia, already stated that is not interested to uh, fill the security vacuum left from the United States. In my personal opinion, that's not the case. I mean, it's not only China is not willing to be a security provider in the region like the US, but is not also capable or doing the same thing that the US is doing. So there is an increase of uh, material transfer, military hardware transfer between China and the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia, but this is not going to be a game changer. And again, as I just mentioned, it's not news. China was already supplying a ballistic missile, if I recall correct, the Dawn Fan 3 uh, in the 80s, and now is increasing operation on ballistic missile, but especially on drone, on combat drones. It's obvious that the US regards any growing closeness between uh, countries that have long been its allies, some would say clients, getting closer to China, getting closer to Russia, or at least refusing to shun Russia in the way the US would like. Uh, are they likely to accept that lying down? I mean, uh, looking at China expansion, not only in the Persian Gulf, uh, but all over uh, Africa, MENA region and so on with the Bolton Road Initiative. Of course, if we are looking uh, uh, at the multipolar order, there is an increase of Chinese footprint. Uh, but then uh, the US security umbrella in the Gulf, uh, in my personal opinion, is still pretty strong, especially to the fact uh, that Saudi Arabia is still looking at counter Iran and Iran is also an ally to China. China probably is uh, one of the few countries, if not only the only one country that is able to manage at the same time relationship with the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia, UAE, Iran, Israel and even Syria. So how will the US react to China's growing presence in the Arab world? Uh, 2023 definitely is going to be the year of uncertainty. So as I mentioned earlier, uh, multipolar order and hedging bet is the new name of the game. From a security spend point, uh, I still believe uh, that there is no chance to alter the status quo of the US uh, as a security guarantor in the region. Uh, even the fact that the relationship, especially the Saudi-US relationship, are getting uh, very strained lately, uh, especially in October when President Biden requested to quell the production of oil uh, to create some problem uh, in the OPEC plus for Russia, and it did not happen. And then again, comparing the two visits, uh, the one hat in hand by President Biden at the quite cold shower that he received from Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman with the, the completely different lavish reception that President Xi Jinping had. In my opinion, the biggest issue is not related to security at this point, uh, and the equilibrium is still very clear, but it related to the cyber domain, to cybersecurity. It's not only the Belt and Road that is expanding in the Gulf, it's the digital Silk Road where the, basically the rubber meets the road. Well, there's much more of this coming up after the break. Stay tuned. <laughs> 
watching Kale Mahora with me, George Galloway, on Al Maidin Television, coming from London, talking about China and China and the Middle East in particular. Keith, uh, some obvious problems, leap, uh, at least they look like problems to me, leap up and they leapt out of the professor's discourse. How necessarily is it possible to be a friend of Saudi Arabia and of Iran if they are at daggers drawn? and might at any stage uh, break into fighting each other. How does China manage to square that circle? Well, I think I mean, that's obviously a very um, important and, and sensitive question. The first point I would make is that Chinese diplomacy is very skilled. And the second point I would say is that a basic aspect of China's foreign policy is that it always stresses that its relations with one country are not at the expense of or are not directed at uh, in any third country. So clearly there's a, there's a, it's like walking a tightrope, if you like, to balance, say, the relationship between Saudi Arabia and the relationship with, with Iran. Uh, but I think an important part of that is that China always stresses that the developing countries all have common interests and that their common interests outweigh their differences. And what China works to do is to try to overcome those differences. Uh, and I, I would see that as being part of, of the playbook of, of Xi Jinping in, in Saudi Arabia. The, it was interesting that the joint statement, some of the joint statements that, that came out of the meeting in Riyadh talked about some of the concerns that the Arab some of the Arab countries have with, with Iran, uh, but stressed that Iran had its place in the region and that there should, be, uh, there should be dialogue. Had that been the United States as the interlocutor, you can imagine that the United States would be pressing the Arab countries in a very different uh, direction vis-a-vis uh, -vis Iran. Okay, well, here's another one, and it, it flows uh, from what you've just said. Uh, we wish him long life, but the king of Saudi Arabia will die, as we all will, uh, and uh, MBS will be the king of Saudi Arabia, the same MBS that the US president described as a pariah uh, and who, whose fist bump uh, spoke uh, very, very uh, voluminous. Uh, the, the relationship between the US and the Saudi leadership, even now, still more in the future. How is the US going to manage that, do you think? Can we anticipate efforts to clip MBS's wings, undermine him, maybe even overthrow him? Well, I think those efforts have already been uh, going on. When, the, when someone like Joe Biden refers to the leader of another country and MBS, I think we're all agreed, is really the de facto leader of Saudi Arabia already anyway. When Joe Biden refers to the leader of another country like that, it's not just words, there's some actions uh, behind it. And, and so clearly the United States is not just going to say, oh, well, the Chinese are here, we, you know, we, you know, we wish you well and we're off, bye bye. And it's not quite like that. I, I spoke a little bit earlier about the Petro Yuan. And we know that uh, this question of the, the oil being traded in dollars is very, very sensitive. Uh, I mean, the overthrow of Saddam Hussein was precipitated in many ways, at least according to some analysts, by his threat to um, trade, the, trade oil in euros, let alone um, Chinese currency. Uh, but I think what the issue is that the United States is progressively getting fewer and fewer cards to play. That's not to say it doesn't have any. Uh, but the, the, the United States was able to remove leaders in some other Arab countries. There was also one king of Saudi Arabia, who certainly many people in the region uh, felt was, was undermined and, and, and uh, got rid of by, by the Americans. I have no idea if that's true or not, but certainly that's what many people in the Middle East feel. But taking on Saudi Arabia, which is the world's largest oil exporter, whatever we might think of the internal system in Saudi Arabia, it's, a, it's the heart of the Islamic world. It has that tremendous soft power throughout the, the Muslim Ummah. 
And to take that on and to take on the Arab countries standing together, which they showed uh, in Riyadh, is not so easy for the Americans as picking them off one by one. Joseph, you uh, as an orthodox conservative and as a very British figure, must look rather wistfully at this. Saudi Arabia was a country created by us. Uh, the United Arab Emirates were still our property uh, into the 1970s. Uh, long after the Beatles had ceased to be, we were still ruling uh, in the Gulf. And now it's a question of having been supplanted once by the United States, of being supplanted a second time by China. Uh, how, how do people like you view that? Well, I think it boils down to what I call a grand economic suicide, which is net zero. Um, and the reality that if you no longer require the product that makes you the most uh, interesting trading partner to a region, you're going to lose out on influence. That's what's happened with the US. I mean, we can look at the figures. You know, China's been importing and exporting over 130 billion in, in dollars in terms of, you know, outgoings over the past few years. Um, the US is barely putting, well, it's less than 50 billion, both imports and exports. And then you look at the amount of oil that it's actually taking out of the region and what it actually wants to buy. It's a quarter of US oil, which is still a large amount. But the reality is the rhetoric from the US goes into an area that's talking about uh, the Green New Deal. It doesn't talk about a long-term strategy for crude exports like oil. Um, so if you're in that region, you're going to be looking to a trading partner who will guarantee you stability for many years to come and will do big oil deals. My, uh, you know, reserve is where Britain gets involved in this strategy. I see this as an economic suicide. I've said that many times. Um, I believe that if we don't get back to the reality of needing oil to make the world tick, uh, at least in the short term, we're going to fall in the same trap as the US. We're going to lose out on deals that we could otherwise secure because we'll be less interesting to regions like those. And that's that's kind of it in a nutshell, I think. Shahid, uh, the US and indeed Britain and other Europeans have invested vast sums in uh, trying to persuade people that Muslims are somehow oppressed in China. When all the evidence is the opposite, growth in population, growth in the number of mosques, of worshippers, and so on. It doesn't seem that the, the so-called Uyghur uh, genocide has much traction um, where the Muslims are and where Islam emerged uh, in the land of the Prophet. Yes, uh, uh, I would agree with that. And again, I look at it as uh, something which is more in the nature of a propaganda rather than a ground reality. And if you look at China's relations, which uh, Keith uh, very clearly touched upon very uh, properly uh, in terms of their diplomatic skills, uh, the Muslim countries, particularly those in the Middle East, are very sensitive, very uh, clear about their uh, religious beliefs, etc., and uh, China has, and 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 Saudi Arabia, for example, is has always been taken on board. Is aware the UAE, uh, including Pakistan, etc. Pakistan is a very close uh, ally of China. So, so if there was something really seriously going on uh, wrong there uh, with the youth population. Muslim population, uh, there uh, they would have been voices coming out. That is not the case. Secondly, I think uh, what we discussed, what we were discussing, I, I just wish to make a point about recent developments and why the, uh, these countries in the Middle East and Africa, uh, including uh, countries uh, like Zimbabwe, South Africa, uh, and are moving towards China. The reason is uh, that, uh, which I touched upon earlier as well, that they feel somewhat threatened with the power of the United States. Let, let's Recent, get a Chinese uh, perspective. Dr. Anar Tangan is in Beijing. 
Uh, he's a political and economics affairs commentator, a regular contributor to Chinese television and major networks in the world. Uh, Dr. Anar, welcome back to the show. Oh, my pleasure. Well, President Biden left empty handed uh, with only a fist bump to remember on his visit last year to Riyadh. But uh, President Xi Jinping signed multiple agreements. Was this difference in the reception in Saudi Arabia expected by people? Well, I, from everyone except uh, people in Washington, um, you know, quite frankly, it's the difference between a customer and a competitor. China uh, gets about 70% of its oil uh, from uh, outside of China, imports. Uh, about 15% of that is supplied by Saudi Arabia. The United States is a, going to be a net exporter of oil and is therefore a competitor. There's also uh, this issue about the uh, criticisms that the U.S. Uh, continues to level at Saudi Arabia. Um, Biden, you know, for some reason thought that the uh, MBS was going to do him a favor by announcing the oil numbers reduction after uh, the midterms. And he was furious that uh, MBS hadn't done so. But he, I mean, the first time he met him, he refused to shake his hand. Uh, he's called them all sorts of names. Uh, the visit what did not, uh, that he made with MBS did not result in any breakthroughs. And there's a lot of lecturing and telling, um, you know, the Saudis what they should and shouldn't do and, you know, what they should do about Russia and how they should stay away from China. Um, and it's just kind of the end of the um, post-Cold War uh, American uh, hegemony. And at this juncture, uh, China is offering trade, uh, their agreements, and they're not just coming and uh, using threats and saying you have to toe the line. Given all these agreements, should we expect a wider presence of China in the region from now on? Uh, I, it's already a very large presence. Uh, I mean, the, the oil imports and um, you know, relations with all of the Arab kingdoms uh, is, is very advanced and very long term. Uh, they see China as a willing trade partner who does not try to interfere in their internal affairs, unlike uh, the United States and other countries. So yes, uh, they want to create a future for themselves where they're not beholden to one country. It's a multi-polar world and they want to you know, be able to exercise who they uh, trade with, why they don't wanna be brought in to other people's problems. And quite frankly, the United States has worn out its welcome in the Middle East. After years of war and in essence being a rogue state, um, you know, there's just no patience. Uh, the kind of colonial arrogance and lecturing, it just doesn't play well anymore. People aren't afraid to speak up, as we saw in South Africa. And quite clearly, uh, the Middle East is charting its own course, country by country. It's obvious that the U.S. regards any growing closeness between uh, countries that have long been its allies getting closer to China. A maneuver by China to, as it were, edge the United States out to lessen their influence, to take their place. What do you think? Well, it's 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 nonsense. I mean, uh, China is not coming in there with any kind of ideological, um, you know, boots on the ground saying you have to do this, that, or the other thing. That's the whole point. Uh, and it's Saudi Arabia and other countries that are interested in joining the Shanghai Cooperation Organization, which is a group that's um, you know, basically dedicated to making sure that there's stability in the region. So this is what China is offering, trade, stability, uh, you know, mutual interest. What is the U.S. offering? Uh, this idea that somehow uh, China is pushing the U.S. aside is nonsense. The U.S. has left a vacuum. It's become a competitor with the Middle East. And now they're saying that, you know, well, despite the fact that we're your competitor, we don't want you to play with anybody else. And as I said, that's becoming a very tired line. And then no one in the Middle East is really interested in it anymore, especially after all the wars, um, you know, Iraq, Syria. I mean, it, it's, you know, oil is being taken every day uh, in the Kur Kurdish controlled area through using U.S. trucks. Um, you know, it, it, that doesn't escape people's notice there. The American public might not want to recognize it, but quite frankly, it's going on. And most of these nations realize that if the U.S. could do the same to them, they would.
Do you think there'll be any U.S. reaction to the fact that it seems to be beginning to all go wrong for them in the region? Well, keep in mind that U.S. reaction is based on American exceptionalism, this idea that the U.S. must be in control of the world and that it must put um, all, you know, put every country into a cookie cutter, which is democratic, liberal and capitalistic, um, this, regardless of whether it fits the culture uh, or, or what the people want themselves. So at this juncture, that has become a kind of mantra, an excuse, uh, America's jihad. Uh, where they say that we have to impose that. And in order to do that, we need to maintain absolute king of the hill status. And that means not allowing any other country to rise. And it, it, right now, it's China. In the 70s, it was Japan. So it's quite clear what the pattern is uh, in terms of what uh, Washington's going to do. More of the same. Uh, threats, uh, going back on treaties, uh, you know, in essence, telling countries you have to choose it's us or them uh, and trying as they have in the past to interfere in the affairs of these countries uh, in order to promote what they believe is the, their just agenda. How does China square the circle about the antipathies that exist between countries in that region? For example, Saudi Arabia and Iran. How do you stay friends with both? Well, I mean, each of those countries would like China to side with them, but China is not going to do so. Uh, as you can see with the Ukrainian situation, uh, China is not siding with anybody. They had very good relations with Ukraine. There are nothing wrong. They were relying on it as a vital piece of the Belt and Road Initiative. Uh, but they're not going to be dragged into any war or any confrontation. What they're trying to promote is peace. They want regional stability. What they offer is trade, mutually beneficial trade. And countries can take it or leave it, but it's not going to be at the cost of dragging China into uh, their affairs. There's no, there's no plus for anybody. Uh, China taking a side, as the U.S. has done in the past, uh, would not change anything. The issues in the Middle East have to be decided in the Middle East, not by powers in Washington, Beijing, Moscow, or anybody else, anywhere else. And this should be the lesson that we have learned from Afghanistan, from all of these places where war was used as a pretext to uh, steamroll these countries, but didn't work. Keith, uh, it is a remarkable uh, situation. When the Chinese leaders go to countries, they talk about those countries and China. When the U.S. leaders go to countries, they also talk about China and those countries. China on my mind, as, uh, as the song once said. The disturbing paranoia uh, about the U.S. in relation to China's growing footprint doesn't augur well, really, does it? Well, it doesn't augur well for the uh, the prospects of uh, peace and stability, and I mean this is really the the whole new Cold War, which uh, which the United States, joined by some other Western powers, including Britain, are promoting against uh, against China, but also against Russia, against Iran, against against uh, some other countries. But I think that this will actually impel. The, the developing countries to to join more closely together, and I think that's exactly um, what what uh, happened in in Riyadh. And as we heard from from the Chinese professor, he referred to Saudi Arabia's interest in joining the Shanghai Cooperation Organization uh, just before um, just before the summit in Riyadh. Qatar was admitted as a as an observer to the Shanghai Cooperation Organization. One of the interesting things is that. Um, Iran has become recently a full member of the Shanghai Cooperation Organization. Saudi Arabia is expressed an interest to join. Both the BRICS mechanism, which presently links Brazil, Russia, India, China and South Africa, which is going to become much more effective again with the return of, of Lula in, in Brazil. But the US policy will inevitably uh, backfire in that. It's what Mao called lifting a rock only to drop it on your own feet. I know that uh, saying, I've used it a few times oh, now myself. Uh, Joseph, you, Keith and I, I hope, will still be here in 10 years, but we can't guarantee it. Still less 20. There's a very good chance you will be. 
what picture do you think you'll be looking at then? Will Saudi Arabia and the Persian Gulf countries be in the BRICS, be in the Shanghai? Uh, will the US be just one of many allies in a multipolar picture? That's the way it's moving. Um, I think uh, what a lot of people do is, is to create an air of short-termism because they tend to look too much at the issues affecting countries now and not look at the grand strategy. And we know one thing China does very well is to look 20 years ahead. Um, and I'm pretty sure that China will still be here. Uh, and I'm pretty sure that the US will, even as a fading power, still be significant. Um, and what I do think is that we have to be pragmatic um, in terms of looking at it from a military perspective. Um, I think we need to steer away from this idea of power building um, from, a, from a warmongering perspective and look more at economic realism. Uh, I think energy is going to be the key focus for the next 20 years. It's not going to change. One thing I'd say, uh, perhaps in response to a, a point you made earlier about uh, you know, the Uyghur genocide and the possibility of propaganda coming out from there, um, I think that's a very real thing that's happening in China. Um, I think that there are some persecutions going on against people who don't fit a certain mould, and I don't think it's to do with religion. I think it's to do with people who perhaps don't reflect the model of what the state wants for them. And people here see that as you know a massive uh, issue, and I do too. But I would also say that the, the two-edged sword is that uh, the liberal hegemony does exactly the same thing to many people. Well, I was just um. about to say, I've, got, <laughs> I've just had a text from Julian Assange in Belmarsh Jail. Um. Yeah, and it may not be it may not be a visible, uh, bloody, um, you know, genocide that we're talking well, about. But look at look at what's happening in Yemen, um, and suddenly you do have something that's more tangible. Um, and I think that's where we have to be very careful with, as I said, short termism. I will always call out the Chinese for any atrocities they commit. Equally, I will call out people who are doing the same in other countries. And I think that's what people have to. Uh, you know, get beyond the nuance of at this stage. We have to call out our dirty laundry, but also look at where the real issues lie. And for me, the number one issue right now is energy and how the world is going to fuel itself for the next 20 years without causing a war. Well, Chairman Mao was wrong when he described the United States as a paper tiger back in the 1960s. It's not even a paper tiger now, uh, 60 years later. But it is an old tiger and it's lost quite a few of its teeth and there are younger, leaner and more attractive, frankly, uh, uh, tigers out there in the forest. And they are to be seen increasingly on the Middle Eastern stage. When uh, viewed uh, by the local population, there's no doubt which tigers are to be preferred. And when their leaders, including some of the most conservative leaders on the earth, who have the most invested in the relationship with the United States, who have been most reliant on the United States for their security and protection and power in their own country, when they are reduced to casual fist bumps for the President of the United States and a red, red carpet welcome for the President of China, you can be clear that everything is changing. I've been George Galloway. This has been Kali Mahora. Thank you very much indeed for watching.